Okay, so let's just uh, get started. <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to have Chris Frith with us today. Chris is an emeritus professor of neuropsychology at the Wellcome Center for Human Neuro Neuroimaging at UCL, University College London, and an honorary research fellow at the Institute of Philosophy in London University. Since completing his PhD in 1969, he was funded by the Medical Research Council and the Wellcome Trust to study the relationship between the mind and the brain. He is a pioneer in the application of brain imaging to the study of mental processes. Uh, uh, he has contributed more than 500 papers to, to scientific journals and he is known especially for his work on agency, social cognition, and understanding the minds of people with mental disorders such as schizophrenia. Many of us have greatly enjoyed his books and it's a great pleasure to have you with us today, Chris. So the stage is yours. So is is everything working with the screen sharing no now we see your email ah. <laughs> i try again let's try again perfect ah good 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 okay so this is so this is my title which hopefully will become clearer as we go on. And um, this is what I'm going to tell you is mentioned, a lot of it comes in our new book, which will be out in September, called What Makes Us Social from MIT Press. And you're very privileged to be one among the first to see the actual contents page. And um, in particular, I'm going to be talking about the sort of where culture comes into the system with these later chapters. Um, and this is my plan of action for the talk. So I briefly explain how the brain works. Then I will bring in the concept of metacognition and my particular version of that. Then I will talk about a special kind of metacognition, which is this explicit meta form of metacognition. And I should warn you that I'm, when I use, I'm using explicit and implicit as sort of euphemisms for conscious and unconscious. And of course, the key thing about metacognition of all kinds is it has both a monitoring function and a control function. So it's getting signals in to monitor and it's putting signals out to control lower level systems. I will then talk about metacognitive reports because the wonderful thing about explicit metacognition is that we can tell people about our feelings and what's going on as far as we know in our mind. And also there's a control function happening here. And finally, I will suggest that it's this explicit metacognitive processes of monitoring and control, which are fundamental to the creation of cumulative culture. So first of all, how does the brain work? In our book, we have structured it very much about three different worlds, the world of objects, so it's a physical world, the world of agents, which is the biological world of goal-directed devices, and the world of ideas, which you might call the mental world. And these three worlds have, I think, correspond to three different kinds of computation, and they're all linked together in this very um, schematic diagram. So at the bottom, we have the physical world, which is sort of model-free learning, where we have our history of stimulation and it produces actions, and this is largely unconscious. In the middle, we have a sort of model-based learning, which I think is particularly relevant to dealing with biological agents, which come in different states. And this is where you have a model of the world and you have a model of a decision maker and you take action. But above this level, there's this second order situation, which is the model of the decision maker. So you just don't have don't just have a model of the world. You can reflect on your model of the world and decide whether it's any good or not. And actually, you can talk to other people about their models of the world. You might call metaconsciousness. And of course, metacognition plays a role in all these levels by linking them together. So next, let's talk a bit about metacognition, which is often defined as thinking about thinking, 
But I want to make it slightly more basic than that, because thinking tends to be a rather high level process. So I, I like we like to think of it as a sort of metacognition as a sort of minder, which is checking if the system is working as intended. And the simplest version of this system, I think, comes in this corollary discharge reafference model, which, as far as I understand it, emerged in evolution almost as soon as we had self-propelled agents. So the problem that they have to solve is you send a motor command via the motor system, which makes you move but produces all sorts of sensory consequences due to your movement but you can actually predict what the sensory consequences will be on the basis of your movement, what you intended to do. And this sends another signal, which is actually signaling the intended outcome. You also have from your sensations, the actual outcome. And so there's an error signal possible here where the, if the intended outcome doesn't match the actual outcome. And I suggest that this is an example of a metacognitive signal. It's telling you something about whether this low level system is actually working. Actually, I forgot to ask, can you see my cursor? Good. And there are various metacognitive pro properties of processes which are represented at all levels of the information processing system in the brain. One of them is precision, that is the reliability of the various representations and processes that you're handling. And the other, which I've already mentioned, is the prediction error. So all levels, you can have these prediction errors. And these metacognitive parameters, as you might call them, they can perfectly well exist in the unconscious level, the implicit level, and at the explicit level. So let me give you an example of implicit metacognition. This is the classic experiment from Ernst and Banks where you have to combine um, representations from two modalities, in this case, vision and touch. So you can see a bar in the screen here, and you can feel a virtual bar in this system here using robots. And you have to combine your vision and your touch to get an estimate of the width of the bar. And um, what is varied in this experiment is how much noise is in the visual signal. So you're actually reducing the precision of the visual signal systematically by increasing the noise. But of course, you can't change the um, precision of the tactile signal. So that remains constant at this level here. And when the visual precision is high, no noise, you're um, estimate of the width of the bar is almost entirely determined by the visual signal. But as the precision of the visual signal decreases, there's more and more of a role for touch. So at this level, the precision of the visual signal is so low that your estimate is entirely based on touch. But there's an interesting sweet spot at this point where your estimate based on both signals is actually better than the one that would be based on the visual alone or the touch alone. And this can be entirely predicted by a sort of Bayesian model, which says you combine the two signals on the basis of their precision, which I'm calling a metacognitive parameter. And I think this all happens at an implicit level. So this is an example of implicit metacognition. But as I say, metacognition can come in all these different forms. Here's another of our very simple-minded model of how things work. So at the bottom, you have implicit processing, sensory input and action output. And there's implicit metacognition is controlling the system, as we saw in the previous example, by taking into account, say, the precision of the sensory input or the expected precision of your actions. And this is happening at an unconscious level. But there's a higher level where we're doing explicit processing and thinking about what we're doing. And that actually gets signals from how well the lower levels are processing and sends signals down to change how they're processing, which I'll come on to. And here you have explicit metacognition where you have a conscious experience of how well this is working. And you can actually tell other people about this, which is my version of culture. And then other people can tell you about what you're doing wrong, which can alter your explicit processing, which can in turn alter your implicit processing. 
and we'll come on to these kinds of alterations later. And this is a very one of my favorite experiments, which I very much hope has been replicated um, from Logan and Crump, which nicely shows the separation between implicit and explicit metacognition. So this is an experiment in which expert typists are typing as quickly as possible in response to auditorily presented letter names. So you set they hear A and they press A and you're measuring the time between each keystroke. And as is well known, when you make an error in a reaction time task like this, you will slow down on the next trial. And that's an example, I think, of implicit metacognitive effects. But the key point of this experiment, as I say, it was done by evil psychologists. So on some trials, the typist presses the wrong key, but the correct answer is, appears on the screen. Otherwise, the experimenters have corrected the error. And on other trials, the typist presses the correct key, but the experimenters show the wrong letter on the screen, so they've inserted an error. And the question is, what happens? And they have two ways of looking at this. They can look simply, do they slow down after making an error? And the results are very clear. They slow down when they make a real error, even if it has been corrected by the experimenter. And they do not slow down when, there's, when they haven't made an error, but one has been faked by the experimenter. But in parallel with this, they're asking the, the typist, did you make an error on the last trial? And here you get quite the opposite result. When an error was inserted, they think they've made an error. And when was an, an error was corrected, they think they haven't made an error. So at the implicit level, they're slowing down appropriately to their errors. At the explicit level, they're being completely fooled by what the experiment has shown them on the screen. Now, I think this shows us two things. First of all, that there's a difference between implicit and explicit metacognition. And secondly, that explicit metacognition is often wrong. And I will try to show this, this malleability of explicit metacognition may be a good thing. So now let us talk a bit more about explicit metacognition. That is the when we're aware of things going wrong in our underlying cognitive processing and make attempts to do something about it. And what I'm pointing out here is that there are these two processes. There's monitoring, that is looking for interesting signals coming from the below in the unconscious cognitive processing system. And there's control, which is sending signals top down to alter the way the system is processing. And this is a quote from some very early work on metacognition where they say a system that monitors itself, even imperfectly, may use its own introspections as input to alter the system's behavior. So the monitoring at this explicit level is very much about introspection. And here's another version of this from our paper with Nick Shea. Again, a very simplified version of how an individual brain might be working. So we have the unconscious system with the green things here are the implicit metacognition, monitoring what's going on and altering our actions. But signals are sent up to a conscious level, which monitors what's going on here and can also alter what's going on in the action selection system. And I'm going to talk now a bit about some of the signals that come up from the unconscious level. And they include things like perceptual fluency, action fluency, and confidence. And of course, the strategies for modifying things when they're going wrong is they say, attend more to what you're doing, explore rather than exploit. And of course, in the very simple case, slow down. You're going too fast for the system. So let's look at these signals that are available for monitoring, which I think are largely what we might call gut feelings. As I said, they conclude perceptual fluency. That's how easy is it that you, how easily was it you just saw the last stimulus? Action selection fluency, how easy was it to choose the next action in the sequence? Things like tip of the tongue phenomena, where you were thinking, I cannot remember 
but I'm pretty sure I, it's worth taking time because I think it's there somewhere. And of course, the most commonly studied one is confidence. How confident am I that I have just made the right response or the response I'm going to make is correct? Now, as I already said, these are subjective feelings such as and things like confidence and fluency are what Thomas Metzinger calls thin and evasive. They're quite difficult. We have to learn how to deal with them and we do not always interpret them correctly. Gone the wrong way. Um, so let's start with perceptual fluency. This is the ease and speed with which we perceive things and it's a feeling we can actually report to others but we don't always interpret it correctly. So this is a classic experiment from Kunz, Wilson and Zients from 1980. And in this experiment, the participants were shown a sequence of irregular polygons, I know, a, a large series of them, and then they were shown in pairs, old and new polygons. And they had two questions they could answer, which of the pair had they seen before? That's the memory question and which did they prefer? And the results were very clear. In terms of recognition, they were at chance. But in terms of preference, they preferred the one they had seen before. And subsequent work by Raber and colleagues have shown that this is actually due to perceptual fluency. If you see something, if it's easy to see something, you prefer it. And in this case, and this is perfectly reasonable because things that you prefer, you're more likely to have seen often and therefore you're more likely to perceive them readily. So you then make the reverse inference. If I perceive it readily, it must be that I like it. But in this case, it's not so. And this is interesting because you would say, well, could they learn to recognize that this feeling of liking is actually a feeling of familiarity and then solve the memory problem? You get a very similar situation with action selection fluency. So when our action selection is fluent, we feel in control of our actions. And this is again reasonable because practice makes our actions more fluent and more accurate. But we can break the link between the feeling of fluency and our actual competence in doing the task. And we can do this either by priming people or by applying transcranial magnetic stimulation to the um, pre-motor um, pre cortex. And then you find people have a feeling of fluency, they think they're in control when their accuracy has actually gone down. So it's very similar to the story about perceptual fluency. What about top-down control? That is to say, when explicit metacognition is used to actually try and work, alter the way the lower systems are working. I hope some of you will recognize this is a very early um, model by Tim Chalice, where he talks about the supervisory attentional system, which I am equating with explicit metacognition. And this, in his version, um, he, he, this arrow was missing, but it's obviously monitoring the low level, what he called contentional scheduling system, this is competing perception and action systems. When it detects that something has gone wrong, it takes action to do something about it and make things correct. And more recently, there's a lot of work on top-down control of this kind, in particular of our confidence. So when your confidence is low, you're more likely to change your mind on the next trial with this particular kind of stimulus. And you might ask to see the stimulus again before you make your responses. So this is actually getting more information. It can also be used, which I find fascinating, confidence can be used as a training signal when there is no external feedback. So you're learning some task, but you're not being told whether you're right or wrong. But if you're highly confident, that means you're probably right. And if you're highly non-confident, that means you're probably wrong. And these training signals actually allow you to learn the task um, as you go on. And a, a particular example I like of this kind of metacognitive control helping you to perform a task is the task of verbal fluency, which is a very popular task of um, neuropsychologists. And when I was a neuropsychologist, I was constantly giving people this verbal fluency task, where you basically ask people, for example, to name as many animals as possible. 
and you can do quite a few. You can say dog, cat, tiger, lion, but eventually you'll run out and you'll say, I know that there are lots more animal names than that. How can I get further? And then you can impose a strategy. Say, right, I'm going to look for animals beginning with A, and then suddenly out of the blue, aardvark and axolotl appear in your memory system. And you can equally do it, you can say, or animals of a certain category like zoo animals. So there are these top-down strategies that you can then use to improve your performance. And the reference I've given at the bottom shows that this works with children, but not until they're about 10. Mm. And here's another example, which I'm very fond of, although the diagram is almost impossible to understand. This is from economists, and it's about anticipated regret. So remember, regret is the feeling, there's, there's a distinction between disappointment and regret. So disappointment is when you didn't get what you, as, as nice an outcome as you expected from your choice. Regret is when you realize that you should have made the other choice and you wished you had done that. But you can also have anticipated regret. And this is, example here is in a special kind of auction. So in the various auctions, you, you bid money and then you're told whether you got your item or not. But then there's a special kind of auction which elicits loser regret, where you're not only told that you didn't get the item, but you're told how much the person bid who won the item. And of course, if it's not very much more than what you bid, then you have regret. And what this study shows is that if people are told that they're going to be told who or how much was paid for the item that they didn't get, they actually bid more than they would if they were not going to be told that. So this is this line here, this is a regret. Um, this is the auction where you know that you will, you will be able to find out whether you regret having bid not enough. This is the auction where you're not told who what the winning bid was. And this is the auction where you're just told what when you win and you're told what the next lowest bid was. So when you have this possibility of, of getting regret, people actually bid more. So again, that's an example of this top down control. Now next, I want to talk about metacognitive report. I'm sorry, you, you may hear in the distance, that means our gardeners have arrived and are mowing the lawn. There's not much I can do about it. Anyway, explicit metacognition, in, at least in humans, and that's why I'm saying this is our human superpower, we can talk about it to other people. And I think this is a uniquely human ability. So we can say how much perceptual fluency we have. We can tell people how they ought to behave in order to improve their performance. So it involves these two mechanisms which relate to monitoring and control. So the control is explicit metacognition tells a mechanism for community, no, the monitoring, a mechanism for communicating to others ideas about states and functions at our unconscious level. So that enables others to monitor our processing. And it also entails a mechanism through which what others tell us, communications from others, can alter the states and functions at our own implicit level. So this is now metacognitive control from other people. And I can, this sharing has all sorts of desirable consequences. So this is the express, classic experiment that Bahadur Barami did where we did what we call social psychophysics. So two people have to work together to make a psychophysical um, decision. Um, so they see the stimulus, they make an independent decision. If they disagree, then they discuss what happened and they come up with a joint decision. And in the right context, the decision of the pair is always systematically better than the decision of the better person in each pair. And this advantage we could show depends on sharing confidence on a trial by trial basis. So they tell each other how confident they were and they choose the answer of the more confident person on each trial. Now, what I want to point out though, these reports of confidence are only indirectly related to the actual confidence that you ought to feel and they can actually be adjusted. This is from Steve Fleming and Nathaniel Dawes second order model of confidence where you have a world state which determines your action, but then you have an observer inside your head, which is not only looking at the world state, but also at the 
functioning of the decision-making system and taking those two things into account can come up with a confidence which depends on what the state of the world is how variable that is and how good the decision maker is giving you an estimate of confidence which you can then report but your report is a function of this it need not correspond to it exactly and this is actually a jolly good thing as i will show you because if you think about going back to the social psychophysics experiment we have to take into account the fact that some people are systematically overconfident and some people are systematically underconfident. So here's some data that Dan Bang collected where he asked people, you know, rate your confidence on each trial on this six point scale. Here is someone who usually mostly uses one, two and three, they're underconfident. Here's someone who mostly use four, five and six, so they're overconfident. If these two people work together, too much attention would be paid to the overconfident person. But what is fascinating is that people automatically align their reports of confidence. So this is an experiment that was done in various countries, including Iran. And um, this is what happens when the two members of each pair do the task alone. And, there's, and this is their average use of confidence ratings. And you can see there's no relationship. One person might be highly overconfident while the other person is highly underconfident. If these, these pairs, same pairs work together, their confidence becomes aligned. So they're now more likely to be both overconfident or both underconfident. So people have adjusted the way they report their confidence to fit this situation. There is one problem that still remains that if your if your partner is not very good at the task and you align your confidence with them things turn out bad because you're giving too much weight to this incompetent person and this seems to be something that we cannot avoid doing so my advice is don't work with incompetent people um, but there's also you can adjust your metacognitive reports to influence others so this was a study done by Uri Hertz in Israel rather than Iran. Um, and this is a slightly complicated slide, but basically you have a client who is getting advice from two advisors and the advisors are rivals. So the client can choose one and ignore the other. So on each trial, the client chooses one of the advisors, then the evidence is presented and you have to say, are there more black or white squares in this display? Then you give advice you hear the other person's advice and you see the outcome, whether your advice was correct or not. And of course, you know from this exactly how confident you ought to be given the difference between the number of white and black squares. So you can measure whether someone is being overconfident or underconfident by relating their advice to the actual evidence that they had. So his overconfidence and underconfidence. And what you find is that people exaggerate their advice when the client is not choosing them, but their advice is better than the other advisor. So it seems rational, but they're actually giving advice which is more confident than it ought to be because they're trying desperately to persuade the, the client to switch to them and they don't really care if they're wrong because they're not being chosen anyway. Whereas the advisor who is currently being chosen has to be slightly careful because if he gives a ridiculously wrong answer, he will not be chosen again. So this is again an example of how you adjust your confidence report depending on the situation. Now, what about the other way around? Instructions from others altering the way the system works. And this is one of my favorite experiments. So I hope it's been replicated. Um, this is all about ego depletion, which of course is something that has not been replicated. So this is the idea that if you have to do a hard mental task for a long time, your ego gets depleted and you're less able to do a difficult task immediately afterwards, which is typically the stroop task or something. In this experiment, different instructions were given, us, given to the subject. So one lot were given the instruction, the standard ego depletion instruction, working on a strenuous mental task can make you feel tired such that you need a break before accomplishing a new task. But the other group were given the opposite instructions. They were told sometimes working on a strenuous mental task can make you feel energized 
for further challenging activities. And these instructions had an effect. If you were, if after you had this depleting experience of doing something difficult for a long time, the limiting res resource instructed people made many mistakes on the new task, whereas the non-limiting resource theory, the people who were told they were energized made fewer mistakes on the subsequent task. And my explanation of this is that after doing this sort of work, you get a feeling. There's a feeling about whether you're, that, that you have been working hard, but you can be persuaded to either interpret this as feeling hard, feeling um, tired, or feeling energized. It's the same feeling, but you can interpret it in different ways. And this expect, affects your subsequent behavior. And this is a horrible um, slide, which I'll try and explain, which is another example of using gut feelings to decide what to do. So this is a task where you're given statements which you have to decide, are they true or false? So that's the statement produces a sense of input. And there's a sort of feeling of fluency. So you can immediately feel this is obviously true or this is obviously false. And um, you take account of this fluency in which the answer arrives to give your answer. So you might decide if it's easy, it's true. If it's difficult, it's false. If it feels easy, it must be true. If it feels difficult, it must be false. But you can obviously set up situations. In fact, this is the case with Kahneman's bat and ball problem, where you say the bat and the ball together cost one pound ten, the bat is one pound more than the ball. What does the ball cost? And people say that's easy, the ball costs 10p, which of course is wrong. So you can easily set up tasks where the easy answer is the wrong one. And people can learn to reverse their response to gut feelings. So they say if it's easy, it must be false. If it's difficult, it must be true. And likewise, a teacher can tell you if it's easy, it must be false. And if it's difficult, it must be true. So again, you're learning how to interpret your gut feelings in order to produce better behavior, or in some cases, of course, in order to control your behavior. How does this all work? Back to the brain. And what I'm going to suggest is instructions work by altering our priors in this Bayesian system. So, a popular um, experiment in the economic literature is trust game. So you learn, you, you play a trust game with a series of partners, you can give them money and you hope to get it back from them with interest. But some partners are trustworthy and they do give you back money with interest. And some partners are untrustworthy who take the money and run. And you can learn that by trial and error. You can learn which are the trustworthy partners and which are the untrustworthy partners. But you can also learn by instruction. So the experiment says these are the trustworthy people and these are the untrustworthy people. And they even give you a vignette about why they're such nice people. And that overrides the effects of the direct information interaction. So you go on giving money to the person you've been told is trustworthy, even though they're likely not to give it back to you. And the same thing can be seen in the brain. So you do exactly the same task, but you're now being scanned and you get a prediction error. So when somebody gives you back less money, that you think somebody is trustworthy, they give you back less money than you expect, a prediction error, you get activity in the chordate. If they give you back more money than you expect, you get a prediction error. And it's these prediction errors that push you in the direction of are these trustworthy or untrustworthy people. But again, if you give them prior information, say this is a trustworthy person, this is an untrustworthy person, these prediction errors disappear. You base your estimate of the person entirely on the prior that you've been given by the experimenter and you downweight, I believe, the precision of the prediction errors. You say we no longer need to attend to these because I know what this person is actually like. So I think this is one of the mechanisms by which instructions and others alter the way you um, handle your prediction errors from the lower level system. Finally, and this of course is the most extremely speculative, 
what about explicit metacognition and the creation of cumulative culture? Because what I've been showing you now is how the instructions from one individual alters the way your brain works. But my version of culture is you'll be seeing instructions throughout your life with vast numbers of individuals, both present and past, who are altering the way you perceive the world and the way you behave. And I'm suggesting that explicit cog metacognition re representations lie at the interface with culture, which is what I've just said. And we've really talked about this. Signals arising from the unconscious level can be converted into representations that can be communicated. And communications are converted into signals that can be can modulate our sub-personal cognitive processes. And it's at this point where we communicate with others that all this happens. And this sharing is the engine of community of culture, creating consensus, predictability, and potentially greater accuracy. I mean, this is in a sense how science works. We share with each other our models of the world, and these models as a result of this sharing gradually get better and better. There's more agreement about them. And with any luck, they're also more accurate in predicting what's going to happen. So that's why I think explicit metacognition is critical to creating cumulative culture. And this, I'm following, of course, Dan Sperber, who wrote this book about cultural transmission. And he says that there are two basic aspects of cultural transmission, which I now think correspond to this explicit metacognition. So the bottom-up process is making a mental, mental representation public. That's the output and enabling people to monitor you. And top down is the internalizing a mental version of a public representation, which is how other, what other people believe affects you. And I give two examples where I, of such cultural priors that might emerge in this way. One such cultural prior is our belief in free will. So I'm not going to argue about whether or not we have free will. I'm just going to argue that we believe that we have free will. And this is actually very important for social cohesion. And this belief is associated with the feeling of being in control, which I thought about, talked about earlier, and um, the fluency of action selection. But we also have this feeling, not only when we are in control, we believe that I am causing this event and that I could have done otherwise. This is where regret comes from. There would be no regret if we didn't believe that I could have made the other choice. And regret is a very powerful emotion. And as I say, it can lead to powerful feelings of regret, which some of us believe might be the beginning starting point of consciousness, because we regret is so important, at least in Thomas Metzinger's life. Um, what about the experience of free will? This goes right back to Epicurus many thousands of years ago. So children learn that they will be held responsible for their actions. And the sense of agency becomes intimately associated with moral responsibility. I know from my grandchildren how easily they learn to say, it was a mistake, I didn't mean to do it when they've hit their sister or whatever. This is an example of avoiding responsibility by saying I was not the agent of this action. And indeed, most people, this comes from the new science of experimental philosophy, where you actually ask the folk. Most people believe that there's a strong link between moral responsibility and free will. And indeed, certainly in the English legal system, you are not held responsible for things that were done while unconscious. And there are famous cases of someone who killed his wife while sleepwalking, but is found non, not guilty of murder because of this distinction between responsibility or important link between moral responsibility and deliberate actions. And I suggest that the problem of justice, the feeling of justice, which is probably closely related, also comes from this kind of um, explicit metacognition link between ourselves and culture. This comes from rules mostly. So social cohesion is enhanced through our commitment to justice. That's because justice is useful for dealing with um, arguments and various kinds of conflicts. And the idea is that a high level prior about justice has been fixed in most of us from early childhood. So behaving according to the tenets of justice has become habitual to us. So what I'm pointing out here is that the high level belief 
at the top level of the system is actually working how our habits operate at the bottom level. The higher level belief about justice has made um, just behaviour become most of the time habitual to us. We don't have to think about that's why justice is a good thing, we just do it. And this intuitive inflexible behaviour even gives a signal of our moral status to others. People who make moral decisions quickly are perceived to have higher moral standards. So this is an example of the, the, the process working all the way down the brain system from our high level um, beliefs in, calculated in us through child development that justice is a jolly good thing to the automatic a tendency to behave in a just manner. So this is why I think explicit metacognition is our human superpower because it leads to all these uniquely human um, institutions and abilities. And thank you very much for listening. These are some of the people who've helped me but cannot be held responsible for any of these more outlandish ideas. Most of my money these days comes from my pension, although I had in the past have had um, inputs from other sources. And if you want to learn, if you want to be more enlightened about all this, you have to wait until this book comes out. But if you want to be enlightened and entertained, this book is already available. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. It was excellent. Uh, we can ask Chris questions now. If you have a question, just unmute yourself and go ahead. Maybe I'll start with a quick one, Chris. Uh, so I really enjoyed it and, and found the concept of implicit metacognition kind of counterintuitive. So as you were going through your slides, I kind of came to terms with it but I'm still puzzled about the possible interaction between implicit and explicit metacognition. So I'm okay with implicitly being metacognitive of your implicit processes, but yeah. is there any way you see explicit metacognition taking into account also implicit processes? Um, well, I think that's where these signals come from. That is to say my feeling of confidence emerges from the implicit process of decision-making or visual perception. So we may not be aware of how the decision-maker works, but we get a signal saying, I'm not very sure that it's working very well at the moment. That would be how I would see it. But is it really metacognition if you are incorporating an implicit signal whose source you're not aware of and uh, the accurate I'm... results are not that high? So I'm it's okay if I define me the metacognition as a signal that something is not working properly without being very specific about what is going wrong. Yeah, but that's, that's a, I don't want to say poor definition, but it's not as rich as thinking about metacognition as this uh, big brother supervisor of all this uh, knowledge we contain. Mm. I mean, I think, so, I mean, I'd never... The supervisory attentional system of Tim Shannis, I always thought that was just a signal saying things are going wrong. And I'm now more convinced that we do usually don't know what's going wrong. We have to find out to some extent by trial and error or by people telling us this is what you should do in this situation. So if you go back to this gut feeling you mentioned, so if yeah. your gut tells yeah. you that something is wrong and gut feeling is unquestionably uh, an implicit signal, well, no, that's not true. I think that's, that we're aware of the signal. Right. It, I'm talking about the source. You're right, you're right. Yes, so yes. we're aware of the signal. But we're not aware of the source. Yeah, okay. Thanks. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, what I've learned in the philosophy department is you have to, the way to escape for things is to change the meanings of words, yeah. <laughs> I have to, does this mean that you're all convinced? Yeah, convinced, and it's also extremely hot in here, so. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> I think every five Celsius degrees are reducing the percent of questions, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I do think it was super clear. Thank you. So when is your book coming out? Uh, September. September, okay. I have no idea why so long, because it was already in March or something like that. Yeah. And they were waiting for my birthday, I think. 
<laughs> okay, thank you very much, Chris. You really appreciate your time and knowledge. Take good care. Okay, Bye. thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.